wants to worship him. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Amen. We are so privileged that He is our living hope. We have victory in His name. Amen. So join us as we bless His name this morning.
Come on, let's just shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Let's lift up our hands and just thank Him. Let's just thank Him. Come on, can we give God a shout of praise for He's worthy? Oh, it's a good day. We thank you, Lord. Death has no victory. The grave became our grace. The cross was a setup, a setup for our perfection in Christ, so that we could be the better, the better covenant of who God wants us to be. Thank you, Father. Today is a great day. It's a day in which we celebrate our Zoe life. That we've been adopted by the Father, redeemed by the Son. And so too we are joined heirs. We have become the beneficiaries of what God has given to us to have custody, rulership, dominion over planet Earth. So today, this morning, we commemorate and we thank you. Thank you, Lord. That we represent the better covenant of who you are. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for life in Christ Jesus. You are risen. He is risen. He is risen. Christ is risen. You're no longer dead. The greatest love story that mankind could ever, ever fathom, ever know. The story of how you gave your life so that we could have life. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Remain standing. What a day. I know we say Good Friday and then we say Happy Easter. I like to say Great Easter because it's a great day. Amen? One just... Some of you looking like you're still sad. Jesus is he's not dead. He's alive. You need, to, you need to let your neighbor know all's going to be okay. Would you just smack someone a high five and say, come on, he's alive. Come on, let's shout it out aloud. Come on, let's say, say, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Matthew 28, 6. This is the crux of, of what today is. It says, he is is risen and that's what we're celebrating today for those that are joining us for the first time i always say where have you been <laughs> but if you've come for the first time let's just uh, just wave your hands we just want to acknowledge you thank you let's just give them And of course, if you are, you are joining us on live stream, uh, a warm welcome to you this morning as you celebrate with us the goodness of God. And um, for you that are here that made it today, I'm glad you made it. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you made it. Amen. Pastor Thamu's uh, a title on Friday, uh, Charged and Crucified for Being Called the Son of God. What an apt, appropriate theme for, for this week. Don't forget if you're here for the first time, uh, the way in which we give to God and the way we worship uh, God through our giving. At any time you feel led to give, please come through. We have uh, pay machines at the back, so do it uh, as you feel led to do that. I'm going to take my scripture reading this morning. I'm going to get straight to it. Matthew 28, verse 1. And I'm going to read the whole accord of the scripture. So let's get to it. Now after the Sabbath, near down of the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala and the other Mary went to take a look at the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled the boulder back and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his garments as white as snow. And those keeping guard were so frightened at the sight of him that they were agitated and they trembled and became like dead men. Verse 5, but the angel said to the woman, do not be alarmed and frightened, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen as he said he would do. Come, see the place where he lay. 
Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee, there to see him. Behold, I have told you. So they left the tomb hastily with fear and great joy to tell the disciples. And as they went, behold, Jesus met them and said, Hail, greetings. And they went to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. Verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be alarmed and afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go into Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were on their way, behold, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had occurred. And when they had gathered with the elders and had consulted together, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell the people, his disciples came at night and stole him away while they were sleeping. And if the governor hears of it, he will appease him and make him safe and free from trouble and care. So they took the money as they did, as they were instructed, and this story has been current among the Jews to the present day. And I'm going to leave it at there. This is a beautiful story as well that tells us about our new life in Christ. You know, uh, on, on Friday, the statement that Pastor Thamu made, which to, to some people who, who do not have a renewed mind and understand, an, an understanding of being a son of God, where he referred to us as being gods, and my son uh, wanted to send a voice note to his grandma saying that he's a god. And, and then I said to him, let's qualify that. But you have to have an understanding of the cross to understand that you're a son of God. And this is the beautiful thing about, about the resurrection, is when you understand that you are a better covenant, that Jesus paid the price. There was a divine exchange on the cross. Jesus paid the debt. You know, if you, you, you look at today's modern world and you look at the stories and the movies that go, this story, and I say it is the greatest story, better than James Cameron, Quentin Tarantino, Steven Spielberg, this story is the best. It is the greatest story ever told. And it's a story that Jesus paid it all. And he paid it with his life. You know, I, I often think about it. Sometimes in life it's easy to release someone of a loan, of an amount, of a sum, of something of monetary worth. But imagine releasing them off it by paying a price with your life. Not many can do that. That's how much Jesus loves us. That's how much God loves us. So this morning, let's just lift up our hands and thank him. Let's just thank him this morning for life. Let's just thank him this morning that because of him, we have a better covenant that in the substitutionary nature of Christ, of him being on the cross, it allowed him to pay our price. Our debt was paid in full. The grave became our grace. The cross was a setup for our perfection in Christ. And this morning, God, we say thank you. We say thank you that we have salvation. One of the things that Jesus, on his first meeting with his disciples after he arose from the dead, he commissioned them. Three things. Go out into the world and preach the gospel, which is the great commission. Number two, he said, speak in tongues and be filled with the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And number three, he said, move in signs and wonders and heal the sick. And Father, we thank you. We thank you for this, that we are led by your Spirit so that we can be called the true sons of God. We say thank you, Lord, and we bless you that we are the appropriation of who God is on this earth. And we move and live and have our being in you. Thank you, Lord, that you're no longer dead, that you are alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And we thank you for this, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
turn to your neighbor and tell them, I'm alive because he lives. Amen. He lives in us.
morning this morning, we just would like you to take your seats. And we would like to minister to you through song. And even as we do so, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Because his name is above all names. It's the most beautiful name that we know. The sun of heaven down. How vast a love he has for me that nailed him to that shameful. Shed on the mercy see the power of sin and shame erase the crown of name above all names the most beautiful name I know the most beautiful name my I 
world is great joy in the house is the spirit of triumphantness and what a privilege it is to be a people that is victorious in Christ lift your hands to the Lord lift your hands to the Lord. let's pray together raise your hands father we are so thankful that that same spirit which raised Christ from the dead now dwells in each one of us and through it we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord we thank you Lord that our hope does not end at the grave but we can say thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ if in this life only we had hope then we would be the most miserable of all people but Lord you've given us a hope that extends beyond the grave and death you've given us a hope that in in this life and the life to come we will be conquerors because you have taken away the sting and the victory from death and the grave and because of that today we have this indomitable spirit that declares that you are Lord and Christ over every one of our lives and I pray today oh God that if there be any amongst us that have not yet tasted the power of that resurrection that in gatherings like this they will have an encounter with you and they would know you as the resurrection and the life and that if anyone believes in you they will not die but live and that's our prayer today Lord that the, the stone will be rolled away from our lives the veil will be torn in two the limitations would be removed and we will walk in breakthrough because you are a mighty God God. So Lord, I pray in this gathering for supernatural signs and wonders to take place, for healings, for deliverances, for breakthroughs, so that people can know through these signs that you are the living God. You are the only true God. You are more than able to do the impossible in our lives. And I pray, Father, that if there be any amongst us infirm, troubled, anxious, traumatized, challenged, then they will experience the supernatural in our midst today. Oh, Father, let the power of the resurrection become a reality. Heal the sick. Deliver the, 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 those that are bound. Set the prisoners free. Raise your people to a new dimension of living in the spirit I thank you father for today and I thank you that we could live in the power of the resurrection every day of our lives we give you glory and honor in Jesus name and everybody said amen, amen. well take a moment to say hello to those around you before you take your seats and put your hands together at the same time for this wonderful group of ours. They've done a splendid job. Well, good morning. We can feel the power of God in this place. The whole environment is energized with the Spirit of God. And what a nice feeling. To, to sense the power of resurrection amongst us. Amen. So welcome again. Good to have all of you worship with us. And um, so good to see you on the Easter weekend when Johannesburg and Kauteng gets empty that you're still around. Okay, I know that there's some, some visitors from KZN and other places with us, but it's so good to see a house full of people worshiping the Lord on this very, very significant watershed uh, uh, occasion in the Christian calendar. And uh, this is not Easter as in the commercialization of Easter and the way it's been secularized and marketed, but this is uh, the equivalent of Passover. Um, 
and the events uh, of that Passover that Jesus actualized has now become a reality in every one of our lives. And we can make comparative uh, uh, references to the Passover and the, and the principles associated to it and, and enjoy the benefits of that Passover in each one of our lives. Uh, uh, the Passover was a time of judgment in the, in the nation of, uh, uh, to the nation of Egyptians uh, in the Old Covenant. And through that judgment, God brought immunity in the blood and through the blood of a lamb so that those um, who were under the blood and within the framework of, of the vicinity of that blood could be protected and, and immunized from the visitation of judgment by death. And we are so thankful that while the world is being judged, the Passover that has been released for each one of us, Christ the Passover Lamb, has given us protection, not only from judgments, but from death and sin. What a privilege. And may our eyes be open to that reality. So I told you that this Sunday will be part two uh, of, uh, of the Easter message. Call it Easter for want of a better description to the Western Christian world. And I, I did also tell you in the Friday message that the principal charge leveraged against Jesus was that he claimed to be the Son of God. And he was sentenced to death by crucifixion for claiming to be the Son of God. Divine Sonship, as he claimed it to be, was, was, was um, from a Jewish perspective, viewed as blasphemy because such a claim meant that you were equal to God. And I've read the scriptures to you. And as a result of that, they wanted to eliminate him for making such a blasphemous statement that was equivalent to high treason. And, and with that came a sentence of death. Regrettably, the same people that crucified him did not fully comprehend what it meant that God will send the Messiah to the world and he will bring salvation to the world. They didn't understand things like, firstly, that God created man in his, in, in, in his image and likeness so that man would be God's offspring. That's one of the reasons why when Adam was created, God put his breath in him. And the breath of God was not just oxygen. It was the Ruach. It was the Spirit of God that came upon Jesus. And that Spirit, upon Adam, and that Spirit made him a living soul. That Spirit gave him life. Uh, I'm, I'm highlighting that. But that, that Spirit that came upon Adam uh, made him a living soul and he was supposed to live as God's offspring, which would be called son of God. Uh, and the Jews could not comprehend that, and the law of Moses blinded them to that reality, and they could see themselves as adherents to a religion, but they could not see themselves as sons to the creator, uh, belonging to the family of God. In the new covenant, Jesus uh, came to show us that all men are being reconciled to God so that they could be again called sons of God. I have emphatically and repetitiously stated it from this pulpit that when you come into the faith, you are not called Christians. You are called sons of God. God never calls you a Christian. The secular world and the Syrians from Antioch gave that, that description to the church, the early believers, followers of Jesus, when they said, because they were Christ-like, we'll coin a, 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 a way of naming them, and they called them Christians. But the Bible tells us that when you receive Christ, you become a son of God. For as many as have received him, to them gave you the right, the legal privilege to be called the sons of God. 
God does not call you Christian. God calls you son of God. But Jesus came, the eternal Logos came in the person of Jesus Christ to reveal to all mankind that God wants those he created to be restored to the place where they could be um, called his sons again. So the ultimate objective of salvation on the cross was that we will be restored and reconciled to the original place God had for us, which is that we will not be members of a religion like every other religion in the world, but we'll be members of the family of the most, uh, of the most high God. And this is an august family. This is an esteemed family. This is the most noble family that you could belong to. This is the family of God. As I said last week Friday, you're not being connected to the richest man in, uh, on the earth or to the most powerful family on planet earth. You've been connected to the family uh, where God created all things. And that's your papa, that's your daddy. Say to your neighbor, you are called the son of God. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says this, and I'll read from verse 5. We do, however, speak a message, verse 6. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom amongst the mature. And I'd like to think that we are growing up into maturity to understand these things. But not the wisdom of this age. This has got nothing to do with intellectualism or with how you could cognitively comprehend what God is saying here. This is far reaching. And I'll read the scriptures to back what I'm going to say today. Uh, all of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Anyone that rules this age from, an, from a secular and from an intellectual point of view will be reduced to redundancy. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden. This is even the high priest and the Jewish, uh, the religious order of Judaism could not comprehend that in the Messiah, the fully anointed one, God will reveal how all humans should live as sons of God. Even the Jews, the rulers of Judaism did not understand it. And they crucified him. They crucified. That God destined for our glory and that God destined for our glory before time began. This is a pre-existent position. This is something that was in God's mind before the chronology of time began. That God chose to reveal a hidden mystery that will be decoded in the person of Christ and unveiled for us that we will be brought into the most intimate position with God. You can't fast to get into this position. You can't pray to get into this position. You cannot even give the biggest offering to get into this position. God chose you in Christ before time began to be his son. So when people ask you what's your calling, don't tell them Asha. And, and don't tell them pastor. And don't tell them music and worship leader or whatever. That's not your calling. That's your domestic function. Your eternal calling is that you were called to be God's child. And God chose you before the foundations of the earth. And that's why you can run boldly into his presence even without having a shower. Why? Because that's the right at the executive privilege that anyone who's a child of the, of, the, of the heavenly father can enjoy. What a joy that is. I can run boldly in his presence because there's no more protocols like before. In the old covenant, you had to go through ritual and ceremony. You had to follow certain fundamental protocols. There were pedantic rules that we had to obey, but in the new covenant, you come as you are. That's the goodness of the living God. We serve none of the rulers of this age understood it. 
They did not understand it. For if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. Can you imagine that? Even the devil missed it. The high priest missed it. The Jews missed it. The, the Roman Empire and Pilate, the representative of that empire missed it. They killed somebody who was going to seed his life to produce a harvest of seed. And all of you carry that seed in your spiritual wombs today. Uh, however, as it is written, what no eye had seen, what no ear had heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that comes from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. The person with the spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to mere human judgments. For who has known the mind of God so as to instruct him, but we have what? The mind of Christ, and who is Christ? He is the son of the living God. You have that mind to think now spiritually as the son of God. In John chapter 16, and you know, I'm reading a lot of verses to us, not because uh, I want to just read them, but it's so beautifully scripted for us that we don't even have to preach a sermon. You just read the words and it'll explain everything. That's how beautiful it is. And Jesus made some, uh, some, some allusions to his divine sonship in John chapter 16, verse 16 to 33. And these allusions, these things he alluded to, becomes a reality when we see everything from the vantage point of the resurrection. You know, all of his disciples could not comprehend what he was saying while he was living. But after he was raised from the dead, they had a, an ascended, resurrected view that elevated their understanding of what was being said. Listen to this. Verse 16, Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. That means I will die. That means I will be in the grave, entombed for three days. And then after a little while, you will see me. That means I will then appear to you again and at least be with you for 40 days in a resurrected body, presenting tangible evidences that I'm alive. That's what he's saying here. And at, at, at this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean? by saying, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and, beca and because I'm going to my Father, and look at the language, it's familiar language. He's not saying I'm going to the Creator, I'm not going to Yah, Jehovah, hello him. All the Hebrew classical names that are very powerfully understood in, in, in the world of Jewish thinking. But he's not using, he's using a word that is strange and foreign to the Jews. Jews, the Jews never call God their father. Like you would find it very difficult for the Muslims to call God their father. Very difficult. 
Uh, very few religions will view God as their father. And Jesus is introducing a word here. He's no more saying that when you pray to God, you pray to God in the name of Jesus. He's not saying that. And we must interpret scriptures that whatever you ask in my name, it will be given to you. His name there is not Jesus. His name is Son. His name is Son. That's the name in the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In other words, what he's saying is if you speak to your God as, your, uh, as a son, because you're living in the template of the son, you're living in the spirit of the son, then whatever you need, your father will give it to you. And you think about it, how, how generous some of our fathers are. Maybe not all, but some will say no money, but, <laughs> but in, in, in most cases, our parents, our, our, our fathers are there to make sure we get the things. That will, that will help us along our way. Now listen to this, because I'm going to the Father. And they kept saying, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, you, uh, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more? And then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, that's what happened, like on a Friday and a Saturday until he was raised on the Sunday. But your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. You can see, you can see why all of us have to adjust our, even our prayer life. You don't pray to Jesus anymore. And Jesus should not even be added to your prayer. You should be praying to the Father. That's, that's how he said, he, he told his disciples in Matthew chapter 6, our Father, this is how you pray. They said, teach us to pray because you have a different way of praying. And he said, this is the way you pray. You pray, our Father, which art in heaven. Okay? And obviously, you pray in the name of the son, which simply means you pray in the position of son, in the state, condition, and existence as a son. And you have to learn to know that when you ask your father something, believing that you're a son, and he positions you as a son, then whatever you, you, you require, your father in heaven will give it to you. This is rather provocative what I'm telling you because a lot of Christians are like little babies when it comes to these things. Uh, yes, there's power in his name. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. I mean, it reminds them, it gives them, it gives them nightmares to think that when he walked, the eternal Logos walked um, in a human body and performed miracles in the person of, uh, that we know as Jesus Christ, powerful things happened. Now the same authority, same power is being given to you as a son of God. So that wherever you are, demons will fear you and flee. Can you imagine what power you have? That's why the Bible says that same spirit which was in Christ is now in you. And if that spirit raised him from the dead, what can that spirit do in each one of you? It's a very powerful thing. Verily, very truly I tell you, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And what's his name here? Son. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, now is, that's the secret, figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, language but will tell you plainly about my father. And in that day you will ask in my name, again, not Jesus, but in the name called Son. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. 
No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe Jesus replied, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, referring to the abandonment at the cross. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Can you see the language? Father, son, father, son. This is the dyad. This is the dynamic. This is the synergy. This is the congenial, conjugal relationship that God had with his father. And Jesus is trying to bring us into that relationship now. And I've told you all these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So here's some key points. For a short period, you will see me. Then for a short period, you will not see me. And then you will see me again. The death of Jesus implied that he came from God, the Father, to show all of us the way to the Father. Okay, John chapter 17, he says something very powerful here, verse six, listen to this. I have revealed you, now he's praying to God the Father, and he's praying for his disciples, his apostles. I have revealed you to those who you have gave, who you gave me out of the world. So he's talking to his father, he says, God, I came to reveal you to these guys and whoever else you've given to me in this world. They are yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. Everything you've given me as a son. Remember you was equal with God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of all, of all mankind. And everything he created, he created it by that word. And there was nothing that he did not. And then it later on tells us in John chapter one that that word became flesh and dwelt amongst us as the only begotten of the Father. We all understand that. So it is in that context, he's saying, I had to show them how a son lives and relates to you and everything you told me to do, I've done it. All the things you put in me, I've shown them. If, if you said that I will be the head of creation and they are gonna be seated in me, I've shown it to them. If, I, if, if you made me the hair of everything, I showed them how to be joint hairs. If you told me that I'm gonna have authority, I showed them how they can operate in that authority. Everything I've shown them. But now they need to live this life out. And listen to what he says here. This is a very powerful prayer that he prayed, some say in, in, the, in Gethsemane also. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, and I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. The glory has come to me through them. Listen to this, so they're gonna glorify me. I will remain in the world no longer, but they will still, they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, and his name is Father. 
the name you gave me, son, so that they may be one as we are one. Can you see that? The synergy, the unity. In other words, Father, you gave me a name. I'm giving them that name. Like we are one, you and, uh, and them need to become one. We and them need to become one. Can you see this? This is very powerful. So Jesus died, and he was resurrected. Obviously, and in that resurrection, there was a 40-day period where they saw him again, and, and their joy was restored. They learned that in his death, they were being reconstituted as children of God and could, could relate to God as a son would relate to a father. That's what he was teaching them. They learned that like the birth of a child, they need to be born into the family. That's where the wind blows, and the reference was made early on to a woman had to go through labor, travail for a season before a child is born and there's joy. When he, remember what happened to him on the cross. They did not break his bones because he died before the normal tradition was that soldiers broke the bones of somebody that was crucified. But when they came to Jesus, they discovered that they did not need to break his bones because he was already dead. And the reason they broke the bones was that there was no means of escape for crucified thieves or criminals hanging on the cross and who were sentenced to death. But when they came to Jesus, there was no reason to break his bones, fulfilling a scripture that not one bone in his body was broken. But what they did was they took a, they took a spear and pierced his side, the same side that Eve came out of Adam. And blood and water came out, symbolizing the birth of a new people that will come out of the side of Jesus, like Eve was created out of the rib, out of Christ's rib, many sons were brought into glory. Okay, there was a rebirth. This is the point. They learned that like the birth of a child, they were born through the blood, through the water, into the family of God. In that day, Jesus was saying to them, they will not need to ask anything in the name of Jesus anymore, because now that they are sons, they could make direct contact with God and ask him because of the Son. Do you know what power you have and why prayer is so powerful? It, prayer is actually not prayer. Prayer is conversations with your father. It's a father and a son talking. It is intimacy. It's discussing the agenda of creation. It's deep and, 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 and intimate uh, insights into rule, governance, counsel, wisdom, the authority of God, the manifestation of all the things that God wants to reveal in and through his sons. That's why Jesus is sitting in the heavens presently, waiting until all his enemies be made a footstool. What does that mean? It simply means he's waiting for you to grow up into your fullness and conquer all the things that need to be conquered in, in creation. Um, they would, thereafter, they would not know of spiritual matters figuratively, but literally. That's what he's saying. The Holy Spirit will teach them about how they should live their lives in the family of God. John 16, 12 says this, I have much more to say to you more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you, pilot you, direct you, mentor you, tutor you, educate you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he is. And he will tell you what is yet to come. That's how we should be living now. Under the, the tutelage, under the professorship, under the educational skills of the Holy Spirit who searches the mind of God. 
so that he can reveal the deepest things to us. Church should not be about three point sermons to tell you that it's gonna be good and how you're gonna become the next millionaire and five steps to get your breakthrough. That is not Christianity. That is, a, that is, that is a kind of a redactory process editing the deep things that God wants to show us. And we can't have that anymore. We have to have a church where we can, we can sit and go through the deep things of God because of the power of the resurrection that's brought us into this place of, of intimacy. And don't think about the throne room of grace as a place where you just go to get grace. It's a place where you go and delve in the deep things and the secret things of God. That's how church should be. Church should come to a place where the clock doesn't tell us how long we should be speaking, where we would be sitting like Mary sat at the feet of Jesus as he discussed and shared the mysteries of the kingdom. Are you understanding? It should be a time where you are hungry and thirsty for the, the, the inner workings and revelations of the purposes of God. And he says here, he will glorify me, referring to the Holy Spirit, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. And all, those, and all that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to me. This is so powerful. Let me show you a portion of the scripture here. And I'll read it. I'll just read it to you. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Please, I pray that our understanding will be, under, will be open to the things I'm saying here. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard. Say to your neighbor, pay attention. Okay, I know teachers will say that, educators will say that in the classroom, but, but please, we have to pay careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. The word of God is our anchor. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This is our salvation, and I shared some of it with you, uh, the gospel of the Son uh, on Friday. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he, was sub that he has subjected the world to come. Listen to this. God's not giving the world to come, the aeons of time, the very powerful periods in time. Uh, it's, it's not given it to angels. But there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind, humankind, that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You made them, that's us, a little lower than angels, you crowned them with glory and honor, and you put everything under their feet. Not under angels, under our feet. And that's a metaphoric or idiomatic way of saying we have absolute rule over all things. We may not see it for a, moment, for a time being because of our immaturity and our mortality. But let me tell you, God wants to do some powerful things in us. In putting everything under them, God left nothing. Say to your neighbor, nothing. That is not subject to them. Yet at present, yet at present, we do not see everything subject to us. But we do see, listen to this, Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. 
He chose to taste death for you and me. In, listen to this, verse 10. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. And you will see that that suffering was gonna bring you and me into glory. And what is glory? Glory is to be a son of God. To be a son of God means to live in the light. Where the light is, you're glorified. And when people look at you, they see the innate reputation of what God established you to be. Verse 11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So if he's making you holy and he is holy, then you belong to the same family. Say to your neighbor, you belong to the family of God. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In that context, he calls us brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. I will tell people about you in the assemblage. That's the church, the congregation. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I. And the children God has given me. That's us. Since the children have flesh and blood, we are mere mortals, corruptibles. He too shared in your, in their humanity, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. That's what I told you on Friday. When he freed us, you, you can't die anymore. You know, I'm going to a funeral from here in Peter Maritzburg today. But the person in that coffin, Marolin's aunt, she's not dead if she believes in Christ. The tent has come down. But her spirit is alive in the presence of God. That's a reality. You may slip away from this life, but you can't slip away from life. That's the power we have. And, and it's gone. You can't fear death anymore. Because he broke the power over death. In that context, it says here, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants, Abraham's seed. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement, he may cover the sins of people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That in itself is a summary of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That includes every one of us. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. You have to start now learning, and this is, I asked God, you know, I was, I was really struggling to to find a way of articulating some of these things to us. These are not popular sermons that you do in the Easter weekend. You know, we want to shout like we did in the early parts of the service, that he's alive. We want to talk about uh, that, you know, we are now alive in him. But unless this becomes a revelation, unless our eyes are open to it, um, it's very difficult to comprehend the things that we are saying here. Most churches, you can't preach this from the pulpit. The people are not ready for it. And I had to ask God to give me the skill uh, to find words, and I don't have enough of them, to try and communicate the things that this weekend should represent. 
And as I told you on Friday, this is not a weekend to get caught up with the secular culture and the spirit of the sage. This is a weekend upon which you should muse and meditate and contemplate and play with these thoughts until it grips you. You know, I sit in front of the TV and try and watch some sport from time to time. I like sport. But my thoughts are always on how do I assemble this? How, do I, how does this grip my spirit? How do I become a prisoner to this, the deep revelation of what Christ came to do? I mean, if God came to put on a show, then, then God is a narcissist. He's ego, egotistical. He's self-centered. I mean, imagine God coming here to show you he can heal the sick. That's vain. Imagine God coming to raise the dead. But that's foolishness. He created people with life. What's the big deal? Imagine God coming here to walk on water. He created the oceans. I mean, his hand, probably a little portion of his hand will just capture everything he created. That's how big God is. But he didn't come to do all of that. He came to show us a way he came to, to map out that way. He came to reveal deeper plans that God has for us, but he couldn't do it by just preaching a message. He had to become the word. He had to become the message. He had to present it in the most articulate way so that we would understand it. And, and these things have to be gripped. Romans chapter 6 says this. Verse 6. Are you with me? For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with and that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Say to your neighbor, in this weekend, many thousands of years ago, you were killed. You were crucified. It's a representative principle. It was, you were not even born then. But in Christ, you experienced your death. That's what the Bible says here. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. That's a principle. It's called, it's the vicarious principle, the principle of representation. The principle is that he came to represent you and go through the process of death, which for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He came realizing that Adam fell short. Adam traded his sonship. Adam lost his life. Adam, who was a representative of the human race, disconnected the human race, unplugged the human race from sonship, from life, from glory, from dominion. He came on the cross and said, I'll close the gap by dying for all that will still come to be. And when they believe in me, then the power of attorney is that because they accept that I've died for them, they will live in the place I want them to live which is the original intent of God for the whole of creation. And so I cannot die anymore because I will now live in his position of representation. Galatians 2.19 says this, for, though the, the, the law, but for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, in my humanity, I live by faith, listen to this, in, everyone say in, in. the Son of God. In other words, if he is a son, I am a son. If he came to show sonship, and I accept that he came to show sonship, then I will live in the power of sonship. 
Are you understanding? If he shows me that you can have an intimate relationship with God your father, and I accept that, then I can also take God to be my father. Uh, and, and, and because he's my father, I can talk to him directly. I don't have to go through an intermediary. Those are the realities that he's talking about here. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Died for nothing. You know, the, the story in John chapter 11 is very powerful. Let me read it for you. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume. She anointed the body of Christ on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard it, Jesus said, listen to these words, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. He delayed his visit. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you. And yet you are going back. And why were they, were they trying to stone him? Because he was telling them that he's the son of God. They wanted to eliminate him. Now the disciples are saying, you can't go there, they'll kill you. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? And anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble. For they will see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night in darkness, concealed from revelation, they will stumble for they have no light. And after he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. The whole issue of translating death now to sleep. That's why in the new covenant, we don't talk about death as somebody dying. We talk about death as somebody sleeping. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So when he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, and this was the analyst in God's team. He wanted proof on everything, said to the rest of the disciples, let us go also, let us also go that we may die with him. So they thought, you go back to this place, Bethany, where they tried to stone you, they, you we're gonna get stoned with you. Now that's not getting drunk. I mean stoned, really stoned. <laughs> And on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. There's a picture of Jesus and the death and resurrection. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, so he's, he's brought the resurrection from a day to a person. Okay, he is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He is the alpha 
and the Omega. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is now saying, don't look for the resurrection day. Look for the resurrection person. And how do you get to know the resurrection? You believe in me. You believe in me. How many of you really believe in Jesus? You really believe? You're so shy to put your hands up. You really believe in Jesus? Do you believe that he's the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that if you believe in him as the resurrection and the life, you will not die, but you will live? This is eternal life. It doesn't happen at the grave. He conquered the grave. He took the sting of death from death and the victory from the grave. That's why the Bible says, if in this life only we had hope, we would be the most miserable of all people. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this is what he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they, say to your neighbor, even though they die. This should change the way you mourn for those who die. You understand it? Some people mourn as if there's no hope. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Are you living? Just check the person next to you, just see if they're breathing. Are they living? Okay, so, so if you are living, and you believe in me, you will never die. Say to your neighbor, oh, neighbor never die. <laughs> Ask your neighbor, do you believe this? <laughs> yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah. The fully anointed one, the fully equipped one, the fully endowed one, the fully weaponized one. You are the Messiah, the Son, listen to this, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And she said, to, uh, said this, uh, after she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside, the teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. Okay? And, and later on, you know the story about Lazarus, that he was raised from the dead. Here's the point, here's the point. The, you can't celebrate the tradition of Easter, of Passover, of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ if it does not become a living reality in each one of our lives that I believe in Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you believe, then you believe in the resurrection and the life. And if anything happens to you, you will live and not die. And even while you're living, you should be now living in the power of the resurrection. First Corinthians 15 says this, verse 12, and if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Let's go watch sport. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. That means you are still lost then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ 
are lost. And everyone that died, your granny, your grandfather, your parents, your siblings, your closest friends, they're all lost. Then we're no different to the animal kingdom. We just, life ends at the grave. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, look at the order. Christ the first fruits. And remember, the first fruit is the first, or the early fruit, the indicator of what is yet to come. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God. And I'm looking forward to that day. To God the Father, after he has destroyed, listen to this, all dominion, authority, and power. For, that's a causative principle, for he must reign until, everyone say until, yes, he has put all his enemies, all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when he says that everything has been put under his feet, it is clear that this, that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those who are baptized for the dead? Um, if there's, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beast in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? I mean, think about how mundane life is. Why waste your time coming to church? Why must I jump on planes and travel all over the world preaching the gospel? Why make all the sacrifices we make if the dead are not raised? Let us drink, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's the world order. That's how most people in the world live. Eat, drink, die, expire. Do not be misled, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Let me close. Hebrews 10, 5. I'm reading the scriptures. I'm not even able to finish my message, but I'll stop here. Therefore, when Christ, 10, 5, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, in the book. I have come to do your will, my God. This is the council in heaven where the Father, the, well, the Creator, the Logos, and the spirit had a discussion. How are we gonna save the human race? And the Logos, the eternal word said, let me take the form of a human. Let me become the sacrifice to reconcile them. Let me cover their sins. I'll do it because it's prescribed that way. First he said, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire. Nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. 
I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have all been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice. You go to the Middle East now, you'll see some Jews doing that. You go to high mountains like the Everest, they'll be sacrificing. Even Jews go there to sacrifice a lamb in the highest places of the earth. You go to all religious centers, they're still offering sacrifices. This is a very holy weekend in many, many circles. But the Bible says, he made a sacrifice once for all. Day after day, it says there, but when this priest, verse 12, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits. He waits for his enemies to be made his foot, footstool. This is paradoxical language, contradictory language. You're sitting, waiting passively for your enemies to be made your footstool. Who's going to make the enemies your footstool? Why are you sitting? And the word sitting means you can't get up until certain conditions are completed on the earth. He's sitting waiting for us to get up now and become the kings and the priests that have dominion over the earth. He's waiting for us to grow up from being believers to becoming sons of God. He's waiting for us to take the authority that is rightfully ours. And he's waiting for us to come to a place of corporate maturity where eventually the last enemy called death will be conquered. While he conquered it, in our physicality at the resurrection, there will be a change, a kind of a metamorphosis that will take place, where the mortal will become immortal, the corruptible will become incorruptible, and the temporal will become eternal. He's waiting for the caterpillar to become the butterfly. He's waiting for a corporate bunch of people that will emerge in the earth, that's the Church of Jesus Christ, the corporate son, who are patterned after the patterned son, and that son will burst the bubble of chronology. And on that day, when that bubble is burst, called the resurrection, then the last enemy, called death, in our physical experience, will be totally removed. That day is a powerful day, and he is sitting now, no more sacrifices, He's just simply waiting. He's waited 2,000 years. Waited 2,000 years for the church to become mature. And the Bible says here, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifying to us this verse. He says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. And he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no more necessary. You no more need to live. If you understand the revelation of what I'm just sharing here, you no more need to live on a points system. Do you know many religions today, including the extremist, and I don't want to mention their names, they work on a point system. You sometimes wonder why people fast for so many days. They are believing that if you keep certain fast annually, you, you earn points that accumulates for you in heaven. It's a reward system. It's a works system. I mean, I, I traveled all over the world, earned points, and became lifetime with South African Airways. That doesn't mean much anymore. <laughs> But you know, lifetime and you get certain privileges, certain benefits of traveling on Emirates, on South African Airways and so forth. And those points help you to get certain privileges. But if you understand this message of the weekend, it's no more you earning points. You've already got lifetime. You understand? You're already 
surpassed the platinum and titanium levels of engagement. You are no more seeking to, you're already seated on. You've come to your final position. You are in him, seated at the right hand, executive privileges, all authority is given to you. And he made that possible. He wrote, he coded it into your spirits. Uh, he reset your DNA. The genetic code in you is no more after the lineage of a man. It is now after the lineage of God. The blood that flows through you is royal blood. You are the son of God. And now we need to start walking in the power of this resurrected position. You start walking as if you're an immortal, incorruptible, because your sins are forgiven. God has set you free. Amen. Please stand with me. Please stand with me. I'm going to stop my message here. You got the, you got the spirit of what I'm saying today. Do you appreciate your salvation? Do you appreciate how great the salvation is? Let me tell you, if the whole world can understand the mystery, and the revelation of that mystery of Jesus coming into the world, then I think all the religions of the world will be swallowed up by this mystery. And all the mountains in the world will submit to the mount of God. And all the kingdoms in the world will run to the kingdom of our God and say, we, we surrender to your governance and to your power. That's how powerful they are. We're not competing with other religions. We just want them to see how God designed, architecturally designed for the church in Christ to function as his people, as the new human race, as a new creation order for the establishment of his purposes. I am so privileged to be called the son of God. Are you? I'm so privileged to be in the most esteemed family in the whole of creation. The devil hates us because he could not enjoy that position. He was an angel, and angels were not given the name son. And he couldn't understand it, that if he was a little more powerful than the humans, why would humans be more powerful than him? In terms of privilege and authority. And he protested in the heavens. He protested. He said, that's not fair. I was created on the second day. That's when the heavens were created. And he said, these humans were created on the sixth day. I saw you call the stars, the sun, the moon into existence that was created on the fourth day. I saw all of your creation. And now you take me and make me a servant to these humans. And you call the humans your sons and daughters, the sons of God. He said, I can't handle that. And from that day, he did everything to remove God's son from his privileged position. And in the Garden of Eden, he had victory. They fell from sonship. They fell from glory. They fell from everlasting life. They fell from dominion. Now in Jesus, all that comes back to us. That's why the devil hates you, because he hates you being called the son of God. He doesn't have a problem if you're called a Christian. He's, he's got no problems with Christians. He's got problems with people who function as the sons of God. Come church, you have to appreciate who you are. You have to start appreciating the love of God, that he could love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You be what you believe. If you believe he's the son of God, you be that. That's what you become. So lift your hands. Let's worship the Lord. Appreciate him. Appreciate him. 
shalamanda la basi kuto, karabanda la basi kuto, shetele mende le basi kuto, ramanda la basi kuto. Open our eyes, O Lord, that we may behold the wonders of Your Word. Give understanding to us that we may understand the greatness of our salvation. Translate us from mere Christianity into the brilliant glory that you have reserved for us in your family. Elevate us from functioning as mere earthlings, mere humans, to functioning in the divine nature of the Son of God. Remove the veil, O God, remove the veil. We know that you were raised from the dead, but raise us, O God, from limitation, from mortality, from, from thinking like a human. Bring us to a place where we would serve you and serve you as people of the new covenant, as sons and daughters. So many are living defeated lives. Bound by, the, by, by human vices and imprisoned by carnality and living their lives in the flesh. But Lord, bring us now into the glorious liberty of your Son. Bring us into the glorious liberty of true salvation. Help us to walk in the power of the resurrection and understand the privilege and authority we have in you. Oh, I bless this house, Father. I anoint this house. I anoint minds and spirits and hearts today to see the things your spirit is saying to the church. We bless you, Father. We bless you. Take your emblems out. Come. What a privilege today to, to share in the new covenant. This is the agreement. The new covenant is an agreement sealed with the blood of Christ. That's his signature. He signed it with his life. And that agreement is that he will bring many sons into glory. I read that for you from, from Hebrews chapter 2. Thank God as you partake of those emblems. Thank him that you're a son. You're a daughter of the King of Kings, of the Lord of Lords. Thank him that in this covenant you've been given everything you need to live successfully. God bless you.